on the air tonight with a bunch of questions about that deadly disaster at a Tokyo airport. Hundreds of passengers and crew members in that video you've probably seen, incredible, almost unbelievable video, forced to evacuate. Nearly everyone survived. So why were these two planes even on the same runway at the same time? We're getting into it. Plus, the shocking but perhaps not surprising resignation with Harvard's president now out. We're live with new fallout now over the controversy around her response to anti-Semitism on campus and allegations of plagiarism. Then I'm willing to bet that right now you are watching from one of the states where more people are getting sick because it's happening in so many places across the country. What doctors say you should expect from this post-holiday spike and how something you probably got in your stocking may help you pay down your post-holiday debt. Plus, some breaking news as we just are getting ready to start the show here. Some new allegations against a sitting senator, the one from New Jersey. Our investigative team is just chasing down the details. We're going to have the latest as it comes in in just a second. Hey there, I'm Hallie. It is good to be back with you in the new year. We are starting tonight with new details coming in about some of those scary moments at an airport in Tokyo leading up to that deadly plane explosion. I'm sure you've seen this unbelievably dramatic video already. This is when a Coast Guard plane hit a Japan Airlines commercial flight. Huge fireball. Five people on the smaller plane died, according to officials. Uh, incredibly, the 300 plus people on the other plane, the Japan Airlines plane you're looking at, were able to get out. This is video showing people sliding out of the plane, getting onto the tarmac. They're running to get away. Here's another look from inside the plane as it was happening. One teenager on that flight says it was hard to breathe. Says everybody was screaming. And look at that, the windows orange from the flames outside. I'm just seeing this plane I just sat on completely <laughs> destroyed by fires and all my stuff, all my luggage, everything. I only have my outfit that I'm currently wearing. Left. Still no word on how this all happened. Japan Airlines says its plane got onto the runway in what they call a normal manner and that the landing procedure was also normal. The Coast Guard flight had been on its way to bring supplies to Japan's western coast after that area got hit with a big earthquake yesterday. We've got journalists Kaori and Joji on the ground in Tokyo to talk about the latest on that rescue effort. But I want to start with Tom Costello, who's here with more on what we know so far about how this crash happened. And Tom, this is the latest and uh, clearly the most significant of some of these close calls on the runway yeah. here that we've talked about, not just in the U.S., but around the world. This Tokyo airport, it's one of the busiest in the world, right? I mean, they, right. they're and used really to a lot of traffic. That's right. One of the most sophisticated as well. Very, very well-known air traffic control system and a good reputation. Listen, this is important here. The NTSB here in the United States has been warning about close calls, so-called runway incursions. This was a runway incursion of the worst possible kind in Tokyo. That, that Japanese Coast Guard plane, for whatever reason, lined up on a runway apparently to depart, even though there was an inbound Japan Airlines passenger plane, an Airbus A350, that it appears now literally landed on top of the Japanese Coast Guard plane. Five of the six people on board the Japanese Coast Guard plane died. The captain survived, but we're told he's in critical condition. And then the remarkable story that all 379 people on board that Japan Airlines passenger plane, a jumbo jet on a domestic flight, they all got out alive. They all survived. And there's one big reason for that, it appears they listened to the flight attendants who said, don't grab your overhead belongings, don't get grab anything other than yourselves and get out of this plane. And to drive home how important that message is, I interviewed Captain John Cox, the NBC News aviation analyst, who really talked about the fact this is a matter of life and death. Take a listen to what he said. They didn't try to get their, their luggage out and that speeds up the evacuation, which when you have a full A350, which is about 380 people, uh, and you want to get them out within 90 seconds, this is the way you do it. You follow the instructions, you go to the exit, you get on the slide, and you get away from the aircraft. And that's what happened here, and that's why it was so successful. So that's the FAA rule. Everybody must be out of the plane with half the exits blocked within 90 seconds. And that's the challenge, of course, because in America, we do have a history of people grabbing their overhead belongings. It's back right. to you, Hallie. 
Yeah, nothing's more important than your life, right, in that situation. Doesn't matter what's in your luggage there. Can you help a layperson understand, Tom, as you lay out, it now appears, as you say, that the Japan Airlines plane essentially landed on top of that Coast Guard plane. Is that be is help us understand what the pilot of the of that jumbo jet may be seeing? They're using instruments to fly, right? There is yeah. no expectation that somebody's on the ground in front of them. They wouldn't be looking for that. Fair to say? Well, I think that that's one question. You're, any pilot coming in for a landing should be scoping out the runway to make sure that, in fact, it is clear of planes, right? I mean, air traffic control may tell you you're cleared to land, but we've had an awful lot of screw-ups worldwide where, guess what, there was a mistake. There's a communication breakdown, and that's the thrust of the investigation right now. Why was that Coast Guard plane, and I want to keep underscoring this, Japanese Coast Guard, not American. Yes, Why was you. a Japanese Coast Guard plane lined up on that runway? Did he or she, whoever the pilot was, did they simply mishear communications from the tower? Did they move ahead despite the communication breakdown? And by the way, you know, all air traffic communications around the world is, is in English, are in English, I should say. So, uh, you know, these are native Japanese speakers. If there was any concern or confusion, perhaps they should have broken into Japanese. We simply don't know what happened there and why that plane was in that position. As far as any answers, Tom, your assessment, do we think, and I know we can't predict, but given sort of past this precedent here, we're talking weeks, months, right, not hours. So this is the Japanese NTSB that's in charge. If this were a U.S. investigation, they would come up with a preliminary assessment within a few weeks, assessment of all the factors, and then they would roll out an official cause in 12 to 18 months. I can't give you the timeline for the Japanese NTSB. I will tell you they are very good and very thorough, and they are also being assisted by the French a National Transportation Safety Board. Why? Because this, this aircraft was built in France. It's an Airbus, not a Boeing. If it were a Boeing, you'd have the American NTSB helping out. you got two very good agencies, the French and the Japanese, looking into exactly what the breakdown was. And did that inbound air, uh, Jap Japan Airlines pilot, did he have good visibility? Or were any of the upscreen uh, readings, if you will, were they in getting in the way of him seeing the runway right. properly? Tom Costello, thank you so much for your reporting on this and for laying out what is still ahead on that front, too. Appreciate it. You heard Tom mention that Japanese Coast Guard plane. It was headed west, where we're getting a clearer picture tonight of just how bad the destruction was from those powerful and deadly New Year's Day earthquakes. You can see here where things stand now. Buildings just crumbled. At least 55 people have been killed. A couple dozen others have been seriously hurt, according to officials. And some 30,000 people don't have power still. You've got thousands of army personnel, firefighters, police officers from all across Japan now getting sent to the area. They're triaging, essentially, racing against time right now to get anybody trapped in the debris out safely. But look how bad it is. That's what's making these rescue efforts so much harder. Look at this. Roads are blocked off. They're so damaged. One of the airports in the area had to be shut down because the runway wasn't safe. It had cracks in it. Journalist Kaori and Joji joins us now from Tokyo. It's good to have you with us. A government spokesperson told the New York Times that aside from power outages, there's also a bunch of homes, 20,000, that don't have running water. Give us a sense of here we are, 5 o'clock Eastern time in the U.S., obviously uh, later, earlier where you are. Talk about the extent of the damage you're seeing. Well, thousands of people are waking up to a second morning in evacuation centers. As you pointed out, many in their homes don't have electricity or running water. And you have to remember that there have been a number, a series of earthquakes, some of them fairly strong, after this big quake hit on Monday. Look, as a Japanese person living here, you get used to earthquakes. It happens all the time. But seven on a magnitude scale is big. And the aftershocks after them have been fairly large as well. And the experts are saying when something this large hits, the chances of another one of a similar scale hitting are about 10 to 20 percent over the next over the next week. So that's the kind of thing that they're up against. The roads are blocked because, as you pointed out, some you just can't access them because there have been landslides. There are fissures in the roads and what's known as liquefaction, which is very scary because when you have an earthquake this strong, it forces up the land and it, it turns the, the roads into a watery substance. So that's difficult as well. Um, as of now, the death toll in this quake is 55, but the fear is that it may rise because the numbers the officials say they know, at least 120 people are trapped inside the rubbles of some of these buildings. The epicenter seems to be in an area called Ish uh, Ishikawaken, which is on the western coast. Uh, and there's an area there that seems to have been decimated, famous for a lacquery uh, center. But there was a fire there that erupted after the quake that seems to have compounded the problem. 
There's also, you talk about issues that compound the problem, Kaori. There's, there's been forecasts for tsunamis along the coast. That risk has mostly gone down. But now there's this question of snow in the area, the question of aftershocks, right? I mean, the, they're, they're not out of the danger, the danger zone yet, so to speak, especially when there's this push to rescue, to rebuild here. Absolutely. Snow and rain is forecast later for today. And that is a problem because the ground is already soft. And when you have wet uh, conditions that the landslides, the chance of a landslide increases incrementally. And that's what they're faced with. And of course, you have these aftershocks, which continue, which is scary just to be there standing. But imagine having to work through the rubble in those kinds of conditions. And the access itself has been difficult as well. And I think only now, as this is the second morning since that quake, are we getting details of first response trying to get into some of the very remote areas because some of these areas are very um, sparsely populated, very hard access even before this quake hit. Kaori and Joji, thank you so much for being there for us uh, in Tokyo. We appreciate your reporting and your presence. Thanks. Also overseas, we are just learning that a senior Hamas leader was killed in a drone strike near Beirut in just the last few hours. That's raising some new concern tonight that Lebanon could get even more involved in this war between Israel and Hamas. Both Hamas and Lebanon say Israel is responsible for those strikes. Israel has not yet commented on that explosion, whether it played a role in it. But the Israeli cabinet is now postponing a key meeting in the wake of all this. Top leaders had been supposed to talk about plans for Gaza after the war there ends in what it's calling the day after Hamas, according to what an Israeli official is telling NBC News. According to that plan, Israel would keep up for security of Gaza for what they say is the foreseeable future. They would dismantle the Palestinian Authority and replace it with smaller, localized clans. We've got more on what that means in a second. That comes as Israel's tanks and rockets are stepping up new strikes, with more heavy fighting in a key city in southern Gaza, even as Israel plans to pull back a couple thousand troops in a new push for Israel in what could be a year-long conflict, they said. I want to bring in Josh Letterman, who's live for us in Tel Aviv. Josh, we're good to have you. We're glad to have you there. Let me start with what's happening in Lebanon, right? These new strikes that killed a key Hamas leader. What do we know, and importantly, what do we not know yet? We know that Hamas says that this senior Hamas leader was killed in what they say was a drone strike that killed not only uh, the number two in the political part of Hamas, uh, but that same leader is also one of the founding members of the militant wing of Hamas. And this is the most senior Hamas leader known to have been killed by Israel so far during this war, Hallie. Now, the Israelis have been fairly coy about what happened tonight. They're not saying it was them. They're not saying it wasn't them. But we know that Israel has has long vowed to hunt down these Hamas leaders anywhere in the world, saying that they are living on borrowed time. But as you allude to, the real concern right now, this whole region on a knife's edge, wondering what kind of retaliation Israel is going to expect uh, from Hezbollah, from the Houthis in Yemen, uh, from groups in Syria and elsewhere uh, who have already been pretty amped up over the last several weeks because of this war. Uh, groups across the region are already protesting and threatening even more violence tomorrow in retaliation for this assassination. You also have some reporting, Josh, on what Israel calls a post Hamas Gaza. This has been one of the central questions since this war began. What would happen to this Gaza Strip, this roughly 25 mile long piece of land? Walk us through what Israel thinks the piece of it should be. Well, Israel thinks it should not be Hamas, obviously, and should not be the Palestinian Authority, which leaves the question, who should run the Gaza Strip? Tonight, a U.S. official tells me uh, Israel wants to see uh, itself deal with security in the Gaza Strip, uh, but let local tribes, essentially clans within the Gaza Strip, carve up different parts of the Strip uh, and deal with the basic governing functions like day-to-day -day municipal uh, activities such as doling out humanitarian aid. Now, the Israel Israelis are basically putting forward what they want to see in the Gaza Strip. But the U.S. has made clear the Palestinians have a right to self-determination and are going to have a right to decide who they want to govern them going forward. On that note, when you talk about the U.S. role here, we're just hearing now from Houthi rebels threatening that the U.S. will be, in their words, punished for the attacks in the Red Sea. What else do we know? 
Yeah, the Houthis are saying that it is the United States that is militarizing the Red Sea. They are blaming the U.S. for being the one amping up tensions there. Uh, and they say, you know, one of the fascinating things about the Houthis is unlike a lot of these other militant groups in the region, Hallie, that don't seem to be want to drawn into direct military conflict with the United States military, the most powerful in the world, the Houthis seem to be relishing this fight, shooting at a Navy helicopter uh, a few days ago. Uh, they seem to be trying to goad the U.S. Uh, into direct direct military confrontation. That is something the Biden administration says they don't want to see. And at the same time, they say they have to protect this critically important global shipping route. And so this new threat from the Houthis does seem to be the latest indication uh, that these Iran-backed rebels from Yemen and the U.S. may be headed towards some type of an eventual confrontation. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. Live for us there from Tel Aviv. Appreciate it. The president of Harvard University in just the last few hours is announcing she will step down from that job in what is a stunning turnaround after a month of criticism over an appearance here in Washington that sparked claims of anti-Semitism, as well as allegations that she plagiarized some of her academic work. Claudine Gay is now saying in a statement that it's been distressing, she says, to have doubt cast on my commitments to confronting hate and to upholding scholarly rigor. But she says it's in the school's best interest for her to resign. This whole thing started last month when President Gay, as well as the leaders of MIT and Penn, seemed like they were sidestepping questions over punishing students who call for a genocide against Jewish people. Harvard's governing board initially backed Gay on that, along with backing her after the first reports of plagiarism, which the board chalked up to inadequate citation. Now, Gay, if she steps down, will return to her position as part of the faculty. The school's provost will take over in the interim. NBC's Rahima Ellis is following this for us. And Rahima, I have to tell you, um, I, as folks who watch the show will know, I'm home from Israel now after spending um, some time there covering the war in Tel Aviv and, and in the region. One thing I heard a lot, people were very keyed in, Israelis, to what was happening with universities in the U.S., specifically with Harvard, with MIT, with Penn, with this whole saga. I would get a lot, oh, you're from America. What, do you, what about Harvard would, would be the question people would ask. And now here we have this resignation that is perhaps unsurprising given the pressure that Gay was under, but still shocking in how suddenly it came down. Talk us through what we know and how it changed from seeming like her job was safe to her, her leaving the position. Yeah, that uh, the board of Harvard, the 11 member board, unanimously supported her right after that appearance in front of Congress. And now that 11 member board has unanimously accepted that resignation. And it is because of what you said in the intro, and that is the fierce criticism that she has been under. It's been withering criticism. And not only that, but also threats of, of refusal to continue to make donations to Harvard. And uh, it seems that it's been too surmounting, even for this university, which is the wealthiest university in the world with the largest endowment of more than $50 billion. So today, this uh, historic appointment of Gay as the first black woman president of Harvard has now disintegrated. Look at the timeline of from when she was made president in June, July, to now formally she was inaugurated as president back in September. Then she has that appearance before the House with two other uh, presidents of prestigious universities. They speak out, and the questions about how they responded to questions about anti-Semitism on campus uh, was withering at that point. By December 12th, the Harvard board announces Gay will remain in office. By the 15th, she submits some, so she submits some corrections to two articles that she had been accused of plagiarizing in some of her work. The 21st of September, more corrections, this time to her PhD dissertation. Then January 1st, uh, the Washington Free Beacon publishes anonymous complaints about six new allegations. And then Today, here we are, January 2nd, Gay resigns from her position. It was too much for her to weather. She talked about how she felt that uh, she herself was under a lot of criticism and even yeah. some threats. And she wanted now to turn the attention from an individual to that attention now be focused back on the university itself. It's and hard academic to say. Pursuits. Well, and it's hard to say whether that's going to happen now, right? Like, I mean, we, we're not, uh, we're not cr people with crystal balls here, but it is clear that this has struck such a nerve, I think, not just in this country, but around the world. Yeah, no, no question about that. And there are some folks who were talking about the fact that there are some starch conservatives who were applauding this, as well as those who were talking about they were pro-Israel. Um, I want to show you a tweet from... Uh, 
El Elaine Stefanik, who was the woman in Congress, who said basically this is exactly what they needed to do, that the resignation of Harvard's anti-Semitic plagiaristic president is long overdue. Her answers were absolutely pathetic and devoid of the moral leadership and academic integrity required of the president of Harvard. Uh, Harvard. Our robust congressional investigation will continue to move forward. I should mention that um, Claudine Gay has denied any allegations that she is anti-Semitic. But she, again, she, they were also a lot of uh, criticisms coming from uh, donors, including one who is Alan Ackman as a hedge fund billionaire. He was calling very strictly for her. And in a tweet he put out, at to Sally, this is in reference to Sally Kornbluth, who is the president of MIT, who was in that trio of female women presidents, of female presidents of these prestigious universities who uh, appeared before Congress and none of their answers were of the kind that Congress was looking for. And indeed, some people outside of Congress were very critical of that. I should mention to you that our own Al um, Sharpton and the National Action Network is holding a protest, they say, in mm -hmm. front of uh, Aikman's office here in New York on Thursday, saying that it was um, unacceptable that they've called for this resignation. Rahima Ellis, I know you'll be on top of that as this develops. Thank you very much for your reporting, as always. Let's take you up to Rochester, New York, where police say there's no evidence right now of terrorism in an investigation into a deadly New Year's Day crash that killed at least two people and hurt several more. You see, the suspect drove an SUV that had gas canisters stashed in it, and then, this is him, raced towards pedestrians and another car as officers were directing traffic after a concert let out nearby. The FBI Joint Terror Task Force is helping local officials investigate this, and Rochester police say it's not clear what the motive is, but they are saying that this suspect, and I'm quoting here, may have been suffering from possible undiagnosed mental health issues. I want to bring in Emily Aketa, who's been following this one for us. Talk to us about what we know about this suspect, what they did in the days leading up to this crash, and why officials are saying that at this point there does not seem to be a nexus to terrorism. Hey there, Hallie. It's a good question because some of those movements in the days prior to this incident have been cause for concern among investigators. Take a look at the timeline here. It starts on December 27th. Police identifying him as 35-year-old Michael Avery. They say that he drove from Syracuse to the Rochester area and checked into a hotel. On December 29th, they say he rented an SUV, a Ford Expedition, at the airport. And then the next day, he apparently made a half a dozen purchases of gasoline and fuel containers, something that that was recovered at the scene of the crash in and around the Ford Expedition. Police believe that he intentionally uh, sped towards a crosswalk with people, as you mentioned, just as people had finished celebrating the uh, ringing in of the new year. And he actually crashed into another vehicle, a rideshare vehicle that had been pulling out. The force of that crash so powerful that it still pushed the both of the vehicles into a group of people, injuring nine pedestrians, Hallie, and killing the two passengers passengers in the rideshare vehicle, Hallie. Emily Aketa, uh, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. We've got some breaking news just into us now, literally in just the last couple of minutes here. News about a sitting senator from New Jersey, Bob Menendez, who is facing apparently even more allegations, with a federal grand jury now slapping him with a second superseding indictment, saying he allegedly tried to help a developer land a multi-billion dollar investment from a company tied to the Qataris. Remember, Menendez is already facing accusations of accepting bribes from a foreign government and conspiring to act as a foreign agent, among other charges. He has pleaded not guilty to all these allegations. I want to get right to Tom Winter. Walk us through, first of all, what a new superseding indictment actually means in plain English and more about the specifics of these allegations. Sure. It means that investigators and prosecutors went back to the same grand jury or a grand jury that's been hearing evidence in the ongoing investigation. As you know, Hallie, because we've spoken about this on numerous occasions, this has been an ongoing investigation by the New York FBI and federal prosecutors here. They went back to the grand jury and say, we've found some new conduct. Conduct. We want to bring it to you. Would you like to indict the senator or anybody, depending upon the case, on these charges? And in fact, they have voted to indict him and charged him with a whole series of new allegations effectively here, Hallie, saying that the senator, in exchange for some of that cash and gold that we've been showing uh, over the past six months or so, when, uh, when we first learned that the allegations 
uh, were coming down against the senator in his first indictment. Some of that cash and gold from a New Jersey dev developer identified as Fred Davies, who's also been charged in this case, was in exchange for Bob Menendez to introduce him to a member of the Qatari royal family who happens to work for a Qatari investment fund that's associated with that government. Apparently, Menendez made a number of uh, positive or supportive statements of the Qatari government. At the same time, he was hoping to get them to invest into this New Jersey developer's uh, latest uh, project or uh, business, and that led to the allegations uh, being thrown around here today. They apparently have encrypted application messages between uh, the developer and the senator. They also have a series of messages that were sent, including uh, screen grabs of watches that the developer shared with the senator saying, hey, do any of these work for you? And some of those uh, watches were valued in the tens of uh, thousands of dollars, Hallie. So uh, bottom line here, it's more allegations, not necessarily more charges. Doesn't necessarily mean Got more it. jail time, uh, but it is a, a pretty tough gauntlet for the senator here going forward. No, that's an important distinction, Tom. And to be clear here, and we said it, but I think it's worth underscoring, Menendez has denied allegations of wrongdoing. He's been defined in the face of these allegations, in fact. That's exactly right. Pleading not guilty to all the pri prior charges and uh, the additional superseding indictments in this case. Tom Winter, thank you very much for yeah. your new reporting here coming into us in just the last few minutes. We are also just learning in the last couple of minutes that former President Trump is appealing now a ruling out of Maine that says he cannot run on the 2024 primary ballot there. This appeal is not to the Supreme Court of the United States, but to Maine's Superior Court. Remember, Mr. Trump's facing something similar in Colorado. We expect him to appeal that one as well. All of it coming with less than two weeks to the Iowa caucuses. Only one candidate is campaigning in that state today, Vivek Ramaswamy. He's at six events. His campaign says by the end of the day, he'll have visited all of Iowa's counties twice. The reality is everybody, including Ramaswamy, is sitting far behind former President Trump in the polls right now. In Iowa, look at this. It's a dominant lead. Dominant is probably understating it candidly. He's stomping there, polling above 50 percent. We expect to see him in that state on Friday. Vaughn Hilliard is there, a state that he knows quite well, live for us in Des Moines. Let me start here before we get to the Iowa sort of drama. This issue that's happening in Maine, the expectation that he would appeal this decision to not be on the ballot, we, we had a feeling he was going to do that. We have a feeling he's going to do the same thing in Colorado. That is the expectation. The question is, what is the timing here, given these primaries are going to start stacking up on us pretty quickly in the next couple of months? Right. Number one, Hallie, under the Secretary of State's order, she said that Donald Trump's name would still appear on the main ballot if his legal team, in fact, appeals her ruling, which they now have. But get this, under Maine state law, the superior court that Trump's team has appealed to has to make their ruling by January 17th. So we're going to have a decision out of Maine sooner rather than later, and more likely than not, before the U.S. Supreme Court agrees to take up the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling that, in which they determined that Donald Trump should be disqualified from the ballot in the state of Colorado. So now we have likely two states that could potentially, uh, whose uh, uh, pending appeals could eventually make their way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And of course, there are still more than a dozen other states in which lawsuits are working their way through the court system here. So this is all coming to a head here in these upcoming weeks. And this appeal from Trump's legal team in the state of Maine is just the latest step in that direction. Before we get to Maine, of course, the road to that state and to Colorado runs through Iowa first and then New Hampshire. You are in Iowa now, not seeing a ton of candidates on the road today. They've obviously, you know, been out there campaigning. It's going to pick up as we get closer to the caucuses. Talk us through what the expectation is and what you're hearing from people you're talking to on the ground. Right, Hallie, we're just 14 days away now. This is kind of go time, but to your point, it's kind of interesting that the top three candidates, <laughs> Nikki like Haley, Ron DeSantis, and Donald Trump, right. they, they aren't here. You know, I'm here. I'm, I'm waiting for some <laughs> candidates. Uh, but Ron DeSantis, we should note, will be here tomorrow. Of course, he has hit all 99 counties. And it's, you know, this could very well be a race for second place. You showed the polling there. Donald Trump is the clear favorite here in the state. And the campaign tells me that they feel like they have built a robust operation to turn out caucus goers to deliver a 
huge win here in Iowa. But when you look at second place, Ron DeSantis over the last seven months, Hallie, has held more than three times the number of events that Nikki Haley has here and has visited more than three times the number of counties that Nikki Haley has here. And when you look at TV advertising, that's where you see a little different ball game, though. Right now, Nikki Haley, they, her and her forces, they intend to put up four and a half times the amount of money toward TV advertising here in the state than Donald Trump and about twice as much as Ron DeSantis's allies here. So Nikki Haley making a late play on the television airwaves here in the state. We should expect Donald Trump to make his way back to the Hawkeye State come this Friday and Saturday, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard, are you there for the duration, friend? Are you there till caucus day? We're here, uh, here for the entire okay. go, my friend. Pencil us in, man. Five and six Eastern. We'll just, we'll see. Uh, we'll just write it in now. Thank you, Vaughn. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Let's go from the Midwest now to the West Coast because a big storm system is hitting there before moving east, putting millions of people in the Northeast in the path of a potentially huge weekend snowstorm. The first for this season, and for some cities, the first in like multiple years. Some of these early projections here, emphasis early, it's only Tuesday, show that this storm could hit the I-95 corridor Saturday, snow, rain, a wintry mix. But there's still a lot up in the air about how hard and where the storm could hit. I want to get to NBC meteorologist Bill Karens. And Bill, you know my motto now as it relates to weather, which is, it is winter. It, Cold is not news, is. right? Like this is, we no. can't be, you know, we're not going to lose our minds over every time the temperature gets below 30. The, the interesting part about this, right, what makes this potentially news I will tell you, like, D.C., we're in that I-95 quarter. Yeah. We, didn't, we haven't gotten a snow, and I don't remember how long. It's been over a year since we've gotten a bad snow, I think a couple years. That's what's sort of significant here is that some of these places yeah. that aren't used to dealing with this this time of year could get smoked. Hallie, there are two-year-olds in the D.C. area that have never seen a snowstorm. So that, like, that's kind of like, that's the perspective on this. Like, there's kids that are like, what, it snows here? Uh, so, yes, uh, so I don't, I'm not going to disappoint you to the end of this, Hallie, so, but just stay tuned for the, your forecast. Uh, so the storm is now moving on to the West Coast. It's going to go coast to coast. By the time we get to Sunday afternoon, it's exiting off the East Coast. So let's take it day by day here. During the night tonight, some snow in the highest of elevations in the Sierra and California as we go through West. Wednesday, we'll get some snow in areas of Nevada. This isn't like blockbuster stuff, but northern Arizona Flagstaff up to the Grand Canyon, heading down into some of the southern mountains of Utah, we'll get a decent amount of this. By the time we get to Thursday, San Juan Mountains in southern Colorado, northern portions of New Mexico. I know the people in Taos would love some fresh powder. And then we get to the part where we get to Thursday into Friday. This is when the storm starts to accelerate and head into the plains. If you're going to be heading through Wichita, Kansas, I think you have a chance for some decent amount of snow out of this. Friday's our day we kind of get a break from the wintry weather, too warm in all of this south. It'll just be a rain event as the storm makes its way over the top in New Orleans. From here, the storm will head for the mid-Atlantic coast. You notice the blue returns. That's the snow on the map. And I freeze this on Saturday late in the day. This is when the storm would be at its peak for, say, Washington, D.C., Richmond, up towards heading to Philadelphia. The green is rain. There's Hallie right here. Tears of disappointment. <laughs> and then as we go into Pennsylvania, this is where all the blue is. So the mountains of Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, you have the best bet of getting significant snow out of this. Same with areas like the Poconos. This is not blockbuster. This is not one to two feet of snow. I think the highest totals will be six to 12 inches. So that's kind of the bottom line on that. So Hallie, as of now, the D.C. area, I have you in light, but I got a bad feeling it's going to be a little too warm. I've never really seen anybody do like a reverse tease where they say, I'm going to give you bummer <laughs> news, but I'm going to do it at the end of all my talking. So like, you know, we're trying new things here. It's, two th it's 2024, right? Thank you, friend. Bill Karens, okay. Happy New Year. It's good Happy to see you. Good to be back with you. Coming up, we've got a lot more to get to here on the show, including dozens of states saying they're seeing a big spike in people getting sick from some of these respiratory viruses right as we're all coming back to work after the holidays. We're live outside the CDC with what you should know and what doctors say you should expect. Plus, a cyber kidnapping victim found alive in the wilderness in Utah. We're looking at who's typically targeted in this growing and disturbing trend. So tonight, the CDC is bracing for a new spike in cases of the flu, RSV, COVID, colds. Now that all of our holiday gatherings are over and we're winding down, the CDC now says at least 30 states have what they call very high numbers of these respiratory sicknesses, with the latest figures showing that during the week ending December 23rd, right before Christmas, there were about 30,000 patients admitted with COVID, about 15,000 with the flu, thousands more with RSV. 
Some hospitals in four states and here in D.C. have put mask mandates back in place, too. I want to get to Blaine Alexander, who is live for us outside the CDC in Atlanta for us. Listen, this happens, right? Any, any, as you know, any parent with kids knows that when they go back to school after the holidays, it's like we get smoked all over again with some of these respiratory illnesses. It's such an issue, and it's spiking this year. Talk to us about what doctors say we should expect and the, the role of vaccinations and getting our vaccination rate up in some of this. Well, I want to start with that, Hallie. I want to start with the vaccination rate. Right now, the vaccination rate is low. The numbers are lower than they were this time last year. In fact, so low that the CDC back in December put out an urgent message to doctors, basically urging them to tell their patients, at least those who are at high risk, to get the vaccine. So that's certainly something notable right there that the CDC is putting out the message of like, we need to get these rates higher. Let's look at how low they are. We're talking about only about 18 percent of adults have gotten the latest COVID booster. Uh, less than half of Americans have gotten the flu shot. That's lower than it was last year. And so when you think about that, combined with the fact that, yes, you're right, around this time of year, we always see RSV cases, flu cases go up. But this is really the first season that we're truly beyond the COVID pandemic. So now COVID has been wrapped into that kind of list of normal illnesses we can expect around this time of year. All of that is leading experts to say that as we progress through January, cases will continue to rise and peak somewhere toward the end of the month, Hallie. What about the sort of next post-holiday prep that we should be thinking about, right? Like the, the people who could even get a couple of these viruses at once, like the idea of maybe you had holiday celebrations, now you have COVID and you've got the flu or RSV and a regular cold or whatever the case may be. You know what? You bring up a great point. That's exactly what doctors are saying. I think a lot of us sometimes, if we've gotten vaccinated, we can think, OK, if I have the sniffles or if I have a cough, I'll just ride it out. It'll be gone in a couple of weeks. Let me take a little bit of medicine and I'll be fine. Doctors say, though, that you should actually go in and get tested and figure out what you're dealing with. Do you have COVID? Do you have RSV? Do you have the flu? Whatever it is, there's treatment for it. They say that's crucial because a lot of these cases that are leading to this rise in hospitalizations are getting serious when they don't have to because there is treatment available. So a couple of things you mentioned parents. I want to touch on that as well, because, you know, I know when you talk about these respiratory illnesses, especially in kids, they can sometimes take on a different type of form. They can be certainly more serious, especially in younger kids. Doctors say if you see your young child or an infant wheezing or if you can kind of hear them struggling to breathe, get to the hospital immediately. That's something that you need to pay attention to. The other thing is that strep throat is also on the rise. So you want to make sure you get them tested for that as well, Hallie. Oh, man. Yeah, add strep to the mix, too. Blaine Alexander, live for us in Atlanta. Thank you very much. Lots to look for in the next couple of weeks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, overseas in Russia, they've attacked Ukraine's two biggest cities today, Kiev and Kharkiv. Five people have been killed, more than 100 others hurt, according to officials there. Ukrainian officials say they downed missiles that can fly at 10 times the speed of sound. This is after the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, said the Kremlin does plan to step up strikes in Ukraine. Number two, we're learning more about that suspected shark attack in Hawaii that killed a surfer. Officials say his name is 39-year-old, his name is Jason Carter, he's 39. An eyewitness tells NBC News the shark pulled him down into the water since the shark was as big as like a pickup truck. Officials say it was the first deadly shark encounter in Hawaii in 2023. Number three, more than a decade after a woman went missing, her family says her remains were found in a pond near Disney. A volunteer group says it started looking for her more than a year ago and just got some new info from Orlando police that led them to her car. They're still working on an ID. Number four, police today are arresting a man who broke into the Colorado Supreme Court building and started shooting. That's after the suspect was involved in a car wreck nearby. Officials say he pointed a gun at the other driver, then started shooting into the building. Nobody was hurt inside, fortunately. And if you're wondering, hey, might this have been related to the court's ruling banning Donald Trump from being on the ballot? Officials say that does not appear to be the case. They think no linkage. Number five, Tesla says it delivered a record number of EVs, like half a million in the last quarter of 2023, and says it sold nearly two million electric cars and trucks last year, which means it met its goal. Tesla slashed prices throughout the year and faces a lot of competition from the fast-growing Chinese company BYD. When we come back, all those gift cards you might have gotten over the holidays could be a good way to help pay off your credit cards. Some of the creative ways you can crack down on debt and maybe boost your credit score, too. Stay with us. A lot of questions tonight over who is responsible for a bizarre kidnapping scheme that led to the disappearance of a teenage Chinese exchange student. 
He's been found safely, but take a look at this video. The police found him. He's 17, scared and cold and alone in the mountains in Utah. He had barely any food. He had no way to heat himself after his family back in China reported he'd been kidnapped. Thing is, it was apparently all part of a so-called cyber kidnapping hoax. The family wired $80,000 to the alleged captors of this teenager after they got pictures where it looked like he was being held captive. The virtual kidnappers apparently telling the student they'd hurt his family unless he ran into the wilderness and took pictures to make it look like he was being held. Utah police say they were tipped off by both the FBI and Chinese officials that this could be all part of a, what they call, disturbing criminal trend of virtual kidnapping, cyber kidnapping, where Chinese foreign exchange students specifically are being targeted more and more. NBC's Liz Kreutz is following this one for us. It is a bizarre trend, Liz. Help us understand what we know about the specifics of this particular teenager and sort of more broadly what we know about this trend overall. Hey, Holly, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story. And we do know that officials say that the cyber kidnappers who targeted this young man, Kai, were based in China. We don't know who they are. We don't know if we'll ever know who they are. As far as how this all unfolded, officials say that it's likely been weeks that he has been manipulated. Kai was manipulated by these cyber kidnappers. Going back on December 20th, officials in Provo, Utah, found him attempting to go camping. They thought it was suspicious, so they helped him get back to his host family outside Salt Lake City. A week later, on December 28th, is when his family in China reported him missing. At that point, though, they had already wired, as you mentioned, roughly $80,000 in ransom money. That is when officials and police began their search, and they found him holed up cold and frigid and alone in the mountains outside of Utah on New Year's Eve morning. Thankfully, now he is safe and home in China and expected to be okay, but it's a really scary incident. And as you mentioned, it is believed to be a trend that is on the rise. Can we call it a trend? Like, in other words, I think that word gets tossed around a lot. Like, it, apparently yeah. it's happened more than once. I don't know that it's, like, super widespread as far as something that's captured people and, like, their, you know, help us understand, like, the context behind some of these numbers here. That's a really good point. I think trend in terms of seeing these cyber kidnapping or cyber scams more likely, mm -hmm. and maybe not necessarily mm -hmm. exactly how this one played out, but the use of AI, experts tell us, is playing a big role in being able to see this happen more often because you can recreate voices. And that's part of how this is all unfolding. We do know that there's been similar instances from out of Mexico, and now it seems to be expanding this one happening out of China, Hallie. Liz Kreutz, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, nearly 50 people who were at a Mormon church in Utah say they have symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning, according to officials at the church. Police say at least 20 of those people are in the hospital right now. The church blames the whole thing on a malfunctioning heating system. They say they'll close down until the whole thing's fixed. We'll keep you updated with any news on how these folks are doing. Out of our Southern Bureau, rapper Young Thug was back in the Georgia court today for his gang and racketeering trial. Remember, this was paused back in December after a co-defendant was stabbed multiple times in jail. Young Thug's accused of co-founding a criminal street gang called Young Slime Life, which prosecutors say is responsible for a string of violent crimes. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the city of Philadelphia just inaugurated its first ever woman mayor, Sherelle Parker, a former city councilwoman, now the city's 100th mayor. She says she's extremely grateful for the opportunity and that she wants to make the city safer, cleaner, and greener. That last, presumably a reference to the Philadelphia Eagles, as we all think about them in the city of brotherly love. So listen, as the holiday season wears off and we're back to reality, that reality for a lot of us is debt because all the gifts you bought, you got to pay for somehow, right? The average family spent nearly a thousand bucks on presents this year, according to one Gallup poll. And one thing you may not have thought of is paying for those gifts with some of your gifts, like your gift cards. Shoppers were expected to spend something like $30 billion total on gift cards over the season. But like, do you use all the ones you get? Some people stick them in a drawer, or they put them in a cabinet, you kind of forget about them. You can actually use them to help pay down your debt. I want to bring in a senior business correspondent, Christine <laughs> Romans, to break this one down. This is interesting because if I have a gift card to Amazon, I don't yeah. know that I'm necessarily thinking about using that to pay down my credit card. Right. How does it work? 
Well, look, there are a couple of different places, several places really, where you can go and you can trade in those cards for cash. You're going to get 70 or 80 cents on the dollar, and that might seem like that's not a very good deal. But half of all of these cards are never redeemed. Half, Hallie. So that means people have basically gold sitting in their drawers yeah. that they're <laughs> that they're not going to use. So if you can get some money out of it, turn around and then pay down that high interest credit card debt. Credit cards are 20 percent. That's the APR right now. You should do that. Holiday season is going to be tough, I think, for folks, yeah. right? Like you feel this pressure to buy stuff, make sure you've got presents under the tree or whatever. But we know that people are going into debt, yeah. right? We know that that's been an issue now, especially right now at this moment. What do people need to keep in mind for debt? And I think that you're the perfect person to ask about this because <laughs> I know you're very into like that pragmatic focus here. <laughs> well, right now, this is not like other years when you could sort of have benign neglect and maybe you run a balance and you're like, oop, and you try to pay it off, you know, by the summer. You've got 20% interest rates yeah. on credit cards and already a pile of debt that is topped $1.03 trillion. That's, you know, credit card debt. And so at 20%, that's really dangerous. A debt spiral can happen real fast. So people need to make a plan. You got to figure out you got to figure out where you're going to come up with money to pay those things down. You know, when you're carrying a balance here, you're only paying minimum payments. You are going to be in debt for years. Years, Hallie. Minimum payments are really uh, a dangerous thing for most families. Pay as much as you can. Get out from under that debt at 20% interest. It's a real problem. Also, call your credit card company. There was a really good lending tree survey that found that 76% of people who called their card company and asked for a lower interest rate they got it by the average of six points. That's real money. And that's, you know, time invested, but time worth it, right? I mean, totally. if you can make that phone call and get that back. Totally. Uh, Chris, Christine Romans. Great Welcome to back. See you. Thank you. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> Thank you, friend. And thank you for all you did while I was gone course, and overseas. Anytime. Appreciate you. Thank you. We got a lot more coming up here on the show, including some new warnings over, you know, those IV drips, those injections that people use for like energy or to help a hangover. We'll tell you what experts are saying about staying safe at some of those IV spas coming up. Tonight, new warnings about stuff like IV drips and injections at med spas that are unregulated. You've probably heard of these places. People sometimes go to them for like quick boost to energy or, you know, they're hungover. They go, they think they feel better after. Maybe they just want straight up vitamins or even to try to dissolve fat. But here's the problem. Doctors say these IVs can make you pretty sick. The FDA recently warned about reports that some patients develop what they call severe infections and skin deformities after getting unauthorized shots. It's all part of this growing wellness industry worth somewhere around $15 billion right now with questions, of course, about oversight on that front. Erica Edwards is joining us now. Okay, gut check, right? These med spas became popular. People would go get an IV. They say they feel better afterwards. What do they need to be looking for? What is the real risk level here? Hey, Hallie. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, many of these med spas do operate safely. And those that do should be absolutely willing to answer some questions that you have to ensure your safety. Number one, who owns and operates the med spa? Uh, number two, who is administering my treatment and what credentials does that person have? Do not be afraid to ask to see a license or a diploma. And also, is there a licensed medical practi practitioner on site just in case there are complications? It's also fair to ask where they got those products. The FDA, as you mentioned, warned recently that unlicensed workers at some of these spas were using unapproved, unauthorized treatments that they got off the internet. And as a result, bacterial infections are on the rise, Hallie. So how are the med spas responding to this? And what are you supposed to do if you wanna to go to one of these places, but you'd rather not come home with a bacterial infection? Well, usually those infections occur at the site of the injection or the shot in or of the um, IV. And generally, it's because uh, equipment may not have been sterilized appropriately or they were using unapproved. Approved, um, uh, you know, mixtures. We talked with one woman in California who developed a severe bacterial infection after she got hundreds of shots all over her body. They, she said that the workers there told her that the more um, uh, injections that she got, the better. Uh, within 24 hours, her skin was just excruciating and she felt like it was on fire. Now, there are no federal standards for med spas and IV hydration clinics. It's the states that oversee those facilities, uh, with, all with different rules. Now, we talked with the CEO of the American Med Spa Association. He said that what's missing from the industry, Hallie, is a baseline level of, of consistency across all states. And even the industry is calling for a little bit more oversight, Hallie. Super interesting. Erica Edwards, thank you very much for that reporting. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now.
We are coming on the air tonight with a bunch of questions about that deadly disaster at an airport in Tokyo. Hundreds of passengers and crew members forced to evacuate off this plane here after this fireball exploded on the runway. So why were two planes even on the same tarmac at the same time? We're getting into it. Plus, some breaking news as we are getting ready to come on the air here. New allegations against a sitting New Jersey senator. We'll tell you about the company he's accused of trying to help. Plus, the shocking but maybe not surprising resignation of Harvard's president now stepping down. We're live with the new fallout over the controversy around her response to anti-Semitism on campus and allegations of plagiarism. Then, officials telling NBC News it has been a record-breaking month for migrants crossing into the U.S. Why that impact is being felt well beyond the border and what's getting done about it. Plus, how a group of alleged virtual kidnappers forced a 17-year-old to essentially orchestrate his own disappearance in Utah. Police are warning it is part of perhaps a criminal trend. We'll explain a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. It is good to be back with you on this new year. And we are starting tonight with new details from Japan Airlines, saying in just the last few minutes that its crew, they say, was clear to land that commercial plane right before a deadly explosion at an airport in Tokyo. You've probably seen this dramatic video by now. Look at this. That's a fireball there. When a Japan Airlines commercial flight comes in, hits a Japanese Coast Guard plane, that's the aftermath of it. Officials say five people on the smaller Coast Guard plane died. No word on how this happened. It's just incredible to see and to understand that almost, that every single one, actually, of the 300-plus people on the bigger plane, the Japan Airlines plane, they all got out. They all got out safely. You see this video. There they are sliding out of the plane. They're on the runway. They're on the tarmac. They're sprinting to get away. Look at this other look from inside the plane as it was all happening. One of the most terrifying things is right there. Imagine being on a plane looking out and just seeing orange flames. It's just a gut punch there with one teen saying it was hard to breathe, that everybody on board was screaming. Listen. Then I remember looking back and just seeing this plane I just sat on completely <laughs> destroyed by fires and all my stuff, all my luggage, everything. I only have my outfit that I'm currently wearing left. So that Japanese Coast Guard flight, that plane, had been on its way to bring supplies to Japan's western coast after that area got hit with a big earthquake yesterday. Journalist Kaori Ajoji and Joji is on the ground in Tokyo to talk about the latest on the rescue push in the aftermath of that earthquake. But I want to start with Tom Costello, who's joining us now with what else we know about how this crash happened. We're talking about one of the busiest airports in the world, Tom, and now we have this new statement from Japan Airlines saying yeah. that essentially their crew had the clear to land, right? Yeah, the, the Japan Airlines crew, and by the way, this was an Airbus A350. This is a big plane loaded down with 379 passengers, cleared to land on runway 34 right at one of the busiest airports in Asia, uh, and in fact was on its final approach, coming right in like that. But guess what? There was another plane right below the inbound Japanese Airlines plane. There was a Coast Guard plane sitting on that runway. It should not have been there. What happened? Just like that, the Japan Airlines plane came right down on top of the Japanese Coast Guard plane and creamed it. I mean, nobody survived other than one person on that Japanese Coast Guard plane. The captain, he did survive in critical condition, but the other five didn't make it. But amazingly, everybody on board that JEL mega plane did survive. They got out absolutely as quickly as possible as fire then consumed that entire plane and everything around it. Hallie. And part of the reason for that, right, Tom, is because they listened to, it sounds like from what we're hearing from people on board, they listened to the flight attendants who were saying, you know, don't try to grab the 18 bags you brought with you, just get off. Yeah. If, you, if you're ever in a flight, if, for, if you're ever in an emergency, I hope you're not, you will hear flight attendants say that. Leave everything, get off. Leave everything, get off. They repeat it over and over and mm. over again. Now, we're told that the PA system on board this plane may have malfunctioned. So it was literally the flight attendants screaming at the top of their lungs, oh, wow. leave everything behind, get off, get off, get off. Now, that is uh, part of the international protocol, and FAA, FAA rules require you must be able to evacuate a plane within 90 seconds with half of the exits blocked. Everybody has thought for a long time, boy, that is a tall order, especially in America, where we have so many people who may be obese or elderly or not moving very well, uh, but everybody on this Japan Airlines plane did, in fact, get off, and it does not appear at first blush that they were grabbing their overhead bags, their carry-ons, whatever. By the way, eight infants also on board this plane. 
wow. and they all got off. I think we had about 17 injuries or so, most of them considered to be uh, minor. But now that's the question. Why did this Japanese right. Coast Guard plane line up on the wrong runway? Did it misunderstand the communications from the controllers? Uh, did the controller make a mistake? We don't know. We do know that that Japan Airlines flight was cleared to land on that runway. So what does an investigation to get some of those answers look like, Tom? Obviously, it's, it's incredibly involved. We know the French yeah. and the Japanese are working on this. Tell us more. That's right. The French are involved because this was a French-made plane. It's an Airbus. Uh, they will go back and they will look at every piece of data. They have radar data showing the exact precise location for both planes. They'll listen to the air traffic control tapes. They'll interview the controllers. They'll listen to the tapes with the pilots. They'll work. This is one critical question. Was the pilot for the Japan Airlines flight, flight on a different frequency than the pilot on the Coast Guard flight. In other words, you have a ground channel and you have an inbound channel. So was there miscommunication there or failure to connect the dots there? So there's an awful lot to try to figure out. And, and one more interesting factor here, the Airbus, Airbus 350, very advanced plane, but they've got these pop-up displays in which the pilot's critical data is superimposed on the screen right in front of the windshield. Did that obstruct his or her view as they were coming in for a landing? Might they have seen the, the, uh, the smaller Coast Guard plane without that kind of a pop-up display? Listen, there's an awful lot of questions, and we're only in the first 24 hours of this investigation. Tom Costello, thank you very much for being on top of it, for sifting through all of that for us. Appreciate it. You heard Tom talk about, of course, that Japanese Coast Guard plane. It was heading to the western coast of the country, where we're getting a clearer picture tonight of just how bad the destruction has been from those powerful and deadly earthquakes on New Year's Day. Look at this. Look at where things stand now. Or we should say where they don't stand, obviously. They're crumbled. Those buildings, basically debris at this point. 55 people believed to have been killed, 22 people seriously hurt, according to officials. Some 30,000 people do not have electricity. Thousands of army personnel and firefighters and police officers from all across Japan are racing to this area, really scrambling against time to try to save anybody who might still be trapped in all this. Still, that's a very difficult job, given what you're seeing here. Roads damage, that makes it harder for trucks and rescuers to get through. One of the area's airports had to be shut down because the runway wasn't safe. It had cracks in it. Journalist Kaori and Joji joins us now from Tokyo with more. A government spokesperson told The New York Times that aside from power outages, there's also a bunch of homes, 20,000, that don't have running water. Give us a sense of here we are, 5 o'clock Eastern time in the U.S., obviously uh, later, earlier where you are. Talk about the extent of the damage you're seeing. Well, thousands of people are waking up to a second morning in evacuation centers. As you pointed out, many in their homes don't have electricity or running water. And you have to remember that there have been a number, a series of earthquakes, some of them fairly strong, after this big quake hit on Monday. Look, as a Japanese person living here, you get used to earthquakes. It happens all the time. But seven on a magnitude scale is big. And the aftershocks after them have been fairly large as well. And the experts are saying when something this large hits, the chances of another one of a similar scale hitting are about 10 to 20 percent over the next over the next week. So that's the kind of thing that they're up against. The roads are blocked because, as you pointed out, some you just can't access them because there have been landslides. There are fissures in the roads and what's known as liquefaction, which is very scary because when you have an earthquake this strong, it forces up the land and it, it turns the, the roads into a watery substance. So that's difficult as well. Um, as of now, the death toll in this quake is 55, but the fear is that it may rise because in the numbers the officials say they know, at least 120 people are trapped inside the rubbles of some of these buildings. The epicenter seems to be in an area called Ish, uh, Ishikawaken, which is on the western coast. Uh, and there's an area there that seems to have been decimated, famous for a lacquerware uh, center. But there was a fire there that erupted after the quake that seems to have compounded the problem. There's also, when you talk about issues that compound the problem, Kaori, there's, there's been forecasts for tsunamis along the coast. That risk has mostly gone down. But now there's this question of snow in the area, the question of aftershocks, right? I mean, the, they're, they're not out of the danger, the danger zone yet, so to speak, especially when there's this push to rescue, to rebuild here. 
Absolutely. Snow and rain is forecast later for today, and that is a problem because the ground is already soft. And when you have wet uh, conditions, that the landslides, the chance of a landslide increases incrementally, and that's what they're faced with. And of course, you have these aftershocks, which continue, which is scary just to be there standing, but imagine having to work through the rubble in those kinds of conditions. And the access itself has been difficult as well. And I think only now, as this is the second morning since that quake, are we getting details of first response trying to get into some of the very remote areas because some of these areas are very um, sparsely populated, very hard access even before this quake hit. Kaori and Joji, thank you so much for being there for us uh, in Tokyo. We appreciate your reporting and your presence. Thanks. Escalating tensions in the Middle East tonight with the United States in just the last couple of minutes here asking for an emergency meeting at the United Nations over those Houthi rebel attacks in the Red Sea. It comes as we're also just learning that a senior Hamas leader was killed in a drone strike near Beirut, which is raising new concerns tonight that Lebanon could now get even more involved in this war between Israel and Hamas. Both Hamas and Lebanon say Israel is responsible for the strikes. Israel is not yet commenting on the explosion or whether it did play a role. But the Israeli cabinet is now postponing a key meeting after all of this. It's where top leaders were supposed to talk about new plans for Gaza after the war there ends in what it's calling the day after Hamas, according to what NBC News is hearing from an Israeli official. According to this plan, Israel would keep security at Gaza for what they say is the foreseeable future. It would dismantle the Palestinian Authority and replace it with smaller, localized clans. Our Josh Letterman is reporting on all of this. Let's bring him in now from Tel Aviv. Let me start with what's happening in Lebanon, right? These new strikes that killed a key Hamas leader. What do we know, and importantly, what do we not know yet? We know that Hamas says that this senior Hamas leader was killed in what they say was a drone strike that killed not only uh, the number two in the political part of Hamas, uh, but that same leader is also one of the founding members of the militant wing of Hamas. And this is the most senior Hamas leader known to have been killed by Israel so far during this war, Hallie. Now, the Israelis have been fairly coy about what happened tonight. They're not saying it was them. They're not saying it wasn't them. But we know that Israel has has long vowed to hunt down these Hamas leaders anywhere in the world, saying that they are living on borrowed time. But as you allude to, the real concern right now, this whole region on a knife's edge, wondering what kind of retaliation Israel is going to expect uh, from Hezbollah, from the Houthis in Yemen, uh, from groups in Syria and elsewhere uh, who have already been pretty amped up over the last several weeks because of this war. Uh, groups across the region are already protesting and threatening even more violence violence tomorrow in retaliation for this assassination. You also have some reporting, Josh, on what Israel calls a post Hamas Gaza. This has been one of the central questions since this war began. What would happen to this Gaza Strip, this roughly 25 mile long piece of land? Walk us through what Israel thinks the piece of it should be. Well, Israel thinks it should not be Hamas, obviously, and should not be the Palestinian Authority, which leaves the question, who should run the Gaza Strip? Tonight, a U.S. official tells me uh, Israel wants to see itself deal with security in the Gaza Strip, uh, but let local tribes, essentially clans within the Gaza Strip, carve up different parts of the Strip uh, and deal with the basic governing functions like day-to-day -day municipal uh, activities such as doling out humanitarian aid. Now, the Israeli Israelis are basically putting forward what they want to see in the Gaza Strip. But the U.S. has made clear the Palestinians have a right to self-determination and are going to have a right to decide who they want to govern them going forward. On that note, when you talk about the U.S. role here, we're just hearing now from Houthi rebels threatening that the U.S. will be, in their words, punished for the attacks in the Red Sea. What else do we know? Yeah, the Houthis are saying that it is the United States that is militarizing the Red Sea. They are blaming the U.S. for being the one amping up tensions there. Uh, and they say, that, you know, one of the fascinating things about the Houthis is unlike a lot of these other militant groups in the region, Hallie, that don't seem to be want to drawn into direct military conflict with the United States military, the most powerful in the world, the Houthis seem to be relishing this fight, shooting at a Navy helicopter a few days ago. Uh, they seem to be trying to goad the U.S. Uh, into direct direct military confrontation. That is something the Biden administration says they don't want to see. And at the same time, they say they have to protect this critically important global shipping route. And so this new threat from the Houthis does seem to be the latest indication uh, that these Iran-backed rebels from Yemen and the U.S. may be headed towards some type of an eventual confrontation. Josh Letterman, thank you very much. Live for us there from Tel Aviv. Appreciate it.
We've got some other breaking news coming into us in the last little bit here. We're learning a federal appeals court has ruled Texas can ban emergency abortions, even despite federal guidance. The court decided in this case the Biden administration, they say, is overstepping its authority. This decision comes after a wave of lawsuits focusing on when abortions can be performed in states whose bans have exceptions for medical emergencies. Danny Savalos is joining us now. Help us understand the significance of this decision. Under federal law uh, called the EMTALA, a uh, hospital is an obligation to stabilize you if you come to the hospital with an emergency. Stabilize doesn't mean any treatment you want. It doesn't mean experimental medication. It doesn't mean curing uh, an incurable disease. It means stabilize. What stabilize means has been the subject of a lot of debate. And in this case, what happened was HHS, a federal agency, issued guidance saying, we interpret this federal law to mean that stabilization includes abortion. And the court uh, used the language of that federal law, and the only stabilization language related to abortion is delivery. And so the court concludes that, well, if, the, if Congress had intended uh, abortion to be included, they would have put that right next to delivery. They didn't. Therefore, the Biden administration overstepped its bounds when it said that they interpret a federal law to contain a requirement that it does not expressly contain. Can we read anything into this decision and what it might tell us about the other lawsuits on the same topic as well? Or is that um, is that like overthinking it here? No, not necessarily. I mean, the case is really cabined to this particular federal law and additionally to an agency's supposed overreach in deciding what they think that federal law means. Of course, it doesn't change anything about the fact that many states are now enacting anti-abortion laws. And in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision last year, they can prohibit abortion right up uh, they can prohibit abortion completely. They don't need to require any abortion, maybe except to save the life of the mother. That's an exceedingly rare occurrence. Uh, but uh, states have considerable discretion now to decide whether to allow abortion, to allow it at all. Danny Savalos, our NBC News legal analyst, thank you very much for breaking that down. When it rains, it pours because we're getting more developing news here tonight involving sitting Senator Bob Menendez from New Jersey. He is now facing even more allegations with a federal grand jury hitting him with a second superseding indictment, saying he allegedly tried to help a developer land a multi-million dollar investment from a company tied to the Qatari government. Remember, Menendez is already facing accusations of accepting bribes from a foreign government, among other charges. He has pleaded not guilty to any allegation of wrongdoing. Tom Winter is joining us now. Walk us through, first of all, what a new superseding indictment actually means in plain English and more about the specifics of these allegations. Sure, it means that investigators and prosecutors went back to the same grand jury or a grand jury that's been hearing evidence in the ongoing investigation. As you know, Hallie, because we've spoken about this on numerous occasions, this has been an ongoing investigation by the New York FBI and federal prosecutors here. They went back to the grand jury and say, we've found some new conduct. We want to bring it to you. Would you like to indict the senator or or anybody, depending upon the case, on these charges. And in fact, they have voted to indict him and charged him with a whole series of new allegations effectively here, Hallie, saying that the senator, in exchange for some of that cash and gold that we've been showing uh, over the past six months or so, when, uh, when we first learned that the allegations uh, were coming down against the senator in his first indictment, some of that cash and gold from a New Jersey dev developer identified as Fred Davies, who's also been charged in this case, was an exchange for Bob Menendez to introduce him to a member of the Qatari royal family who happens to work for a Qatari investment fund that's associated with that government. Apparently, Menendez made a number of uh, positive or supportive statements of the Qatari government. At the same time, he was hoping to get them to invest into this New Jersey developer's uh, latest uh, project or uh, business, and that led to the allegations uh, being thrown around here today. They apparently have encrypted application messages between uh, the developer and the senator. They also have a series of messages that were sent, including uh, screen grabs of watches that the developer shared with the senator saying, hey, do any of these work for you? And some of those uh, watches were valued in the tens of uh, thousands of dollars, Hallie. So uh, bottom line here, it's more allegations, not necessarily more charges, doesn't necessarily mean Got more it. jail time, uh, but it is a, a pretty tough gauntlet for the senator here going forward. No, that's an important distinction, Tom. And to be clear here, and 
we said it, but I think it's worth underscoring. Menendez has denied allegations of wrongdoing. He's been defiant in the face of these allegations, in fact. That's exactly right. Pleading not guilty to all the prior, uh, prior charges and uh, the additional superseding indictments in this case. Tom Winter, thank you very much for yeah. your new reporting here coming into us in just the last few minutes. The president of Harvard University in just the last few hours is saying she will step down from her position. A pretty stunning turnaround coming after a month of criticism over an appearance here in Washington that sparked claims of anti-Semitism, as well as allegations she plagiarized some of her academic work. Claudine Gay saying in a statement tonight that it has been distressing, she says, to have doubt cast on my commitments to confronting hate and to upholding scholarly rigor, but saying it's in the school's best interest for her to resign. You probably remember this whole thing started last month when Gay, as well as the leaders of MIT and Penn, seemed like they were sidestepping questions over punishing students who call for a genocide against Jewish people. Harvard's governing board initially backed Gay on this, as well as after the first reports of plagiarism, which the board chalked up to inadequate citation. Now, Claudine Gay is going to return to her position as part of the faculty. The school's provost will take over as president in the interim. NBC's Rahima Ellis is following this one for us. The, the context here was the pressure that was building on Gay to step down, starting early last month with that congressional testimony, ending tonight. But in between, it seemed like her job was safe, according to what we heard from the governing board of Harvard. What yeah. changed? What happened? Oh, well, the criticism just kept coming. It was withering criticism. You're right. Uh, initially, that 11-member board unanimously agreed that Gay should stay on. But then today, they unanimously accepted her resignation. And it was a very short tenure that she's had as president. Take a look at this timeline. She has the shortest tenure as president of Harvard. She was announced as president back in the summer and then in September initially or inaugurated formally. Then came December 5th. And that's when she went before that House uh, committee, uh, congressional committee, uh, talking about campus anti-Semitism. And they, as you pointed out in the intro, they were very unhappy with her answer, what seemed when that she would question whether students calling for the genocide of Jewish people should be punished. She received a lot of criticism from inside as well as outside of Congress. And then on December 12th, Harvard Board announces that again she would remain on the 15th, she submits corrections to two articles, questions about plagiarism. On the 21st, more submissions to corrections about questions of plagiarism to her PhD dis um, dissertation. And then, just yesterday, the Washington Free Beacon publishes anonymous complaint with six new allegations, and it was too much. And she collapsed under this withering criticism, saying it was time for her to resign, that it was time to take the attention off of her as an individual and let it focus back on Harvard as an academic institution, engaged and focused on academic pursuits. As you point out, she's going back to teaching uh, in a okay. faculty position, and Alan Garber has been announced as the interim president of Harvard. This has put Harvard squarely at the center of so much of the, you know, so-called discourse, if you will. There has been so much conversation around what has happened um, with this appearance on the Hill, with Claudine Gay, with these other leaders of these institutions here. And there is, as you would expect tonight, a lot of reaction coming in to all of that. Walk us through some of it. Well, some of it is coming from students. Even the Harvard Crimson newspaper had called for her resignation, saying she had to go. These kinds of criticism were inappropriate for her to remain. And take a look at uh, a, a criticism coming from Congress, and that is from... Um, uh, from Elise Stefanik, she said the resignation of Harvard's anti-Semitic, plagiaristic president is long overdue. Her answers were absolutely pathetic and devoid of the moral leadership and academic integrity required by the president of Harvard. Our robust congressional investigation will continue to move forward. We should point out here that Claudine Gay has said unequivocally she is not anti-Semitic. But the criticism wasn't just from Congress and those outside. There was also criticism from some donors, those who were threatening to withhold their um, support, their financial support to the richest university, not just in the United States, but around the world. This coming from Bill Ackman, who is a, a billionaire hedge fund who, um, a person who was very much opposed to her. He said, et to Sally. And this is in reference to Sally Kornbluth of MIT president, who has not resigned. But as you know, Liz McGill, who is the president of the University of Pennsylvania, she resigned just about four days after that hearing on December 5th.
Hallie? Rahima Ellis, there's so much to this, um, and I know there's going to be more threads to pull on in the days to come. Thank you. you Let's take you to Rochester, New York now, where police say there is no evidence right now of terrorism in that deadly New Year's Day crash that killed at least two people and hurt several more. Police say the suspect drove an SUV that had gas canisters stashed in it toward pedestrians, speeding toward another car, too, as officers were directing traffic after a concert let out nearby. The FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force is helping the locals in this investigation, with Rochester police saying right now a motive is not clear, but they do say that the suspect, I'm quoting here, may have been suffering from possible undiagnosed mental health issues. Let's bring in Emily Aketa, who's following all of this for us. Talk to us about what we know about this suspect, what they did in the days leading up to this crash, and why officials are saying that at this point there does not seem to be a nexus to terrorism. Hey there, Hallie. It's a good question because some of those movements in the days prior to this incident have been cause for concern among investigators. Take a look at the timeline here. It starts on December 27th. Police identifying him as 35-year-old Michael Avery. They say that he drove from Syracuse to the Rochester area and checked into a hotel. On December 29th, they say he rented an SUV, a Ford Expedition, at the airport. And then the next day, he apparently made a half a dozen purchases of gasoline and fuel containers, something that that was recovered at the scene of the crash in and around the Ford Expedition. Police believe that he intentionally uh, sped towards a crosswalk with people, as you mentioned, just as people had finished celebrating the uh, ringing in of the new year. And he actually crashed into another vehicle, a rideshare vehicle that had been pulling out. The force of that crash so powerful that it still pushed the both of the vehicles into a group of people, injuring nine pedestrians, Hallie, and killing the two passengers passengers in the rideshare vehicle, Hallie. Emily Aketa, uh, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. We are just learning that former President Donald Trump is appealing a ruling out of Maine that says he cannot run on the 2024 primary ballot. That appeal goes not to the U.S. Supreme Court, but to the state's superior court. He's facing a kind of a similar problem in Colorado. We think he's going to appeal that one, too. All of it coming with less than two weeks to the Iowa caucuses. Only one candidate, however, is campaigning there today, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's got six events lined up. His campaign says by the end of the day, he'll have visited all of Iowa's counties twice. However, look at where Ramaswamy is sitting in the polls. Look at where Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are at the polls. Well behind Mr. Trump, who is stomping at more than 50 percent. He plans to head to Iowa Friday. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is there getting ready days in advance. Uh, critically, Vaughn, we're glad to have you there. Let's start with Mr. Trump, because we know that despite these legal issues that he's facing, despite what's happening in Maine and Colorado, it seems to be a non-factor for, frankly, Republicans, Donald Trump loyalists who say they're still going to go out and vote for him here. Talk us through what you're hearing from the campaign and how much of a nexus there is between the legal problems and the political problems, um, which are sort of two different lanes there. Right. The legal isn't keeping Donald Trump away from the campaign right. trail right now. That's Let's right. be very clear here, Allie. He, none of these criminal trials have started. The civil one in New York, closing arguments are on January 11th. We are told that he will be going to New York City for that, but there's nothing requiring him to even go there. He's at Mar-a-Lago right now, uh, Vanilla Ice, and one of the Ninja Turtles were performing at a New Year's Eve party <laughs> at Mar-a-Lago that he attended. But so far here, you know, he's got a busy calendar looking ahead, but these are the final two-week sprint. And frankly, Ron DeSantis isn't here today either, though, and Nikki Haley. And when you look right. at that polling alley, he is a far and away the favorite here and has been for the last year. He launched his campaign a year ago, November, and yet that is where you see the campaign advertising of Nikki Haley. Uh, her allies intend to spend uh, about four and a half times that, that Donald Trump and his allies are going to spend over the next two weeks. But is it a little too late? That's uh, what we'll have a little bit more clarity come 14 days from now on January 15th, the night of the Iowa caucus. So talk about Iowa, right? Because there, as you just laid out, they're not there necessarily. Their ads are in many instances. Plus, we're about a week out to the next debate where it looks like it could possibly just be Nikki Haley v. Ron DeSantis, right? Like, because of a whole bunch of reasons that you're going to explain. I'm not, I, you don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not going to ask you to predict what could change in the next couple of weeks. But given where the momentum and the trajectory is, um, what are the things that you're looking for over the course of the next 14 days where you are? 
Holly, you and I, eight years ago, went around <laughs> this state, I think almost all 99 counties. At the time, we were following around Ted Cruz's campaign. That's right. In Ted Cruz, he visited all of Iowa's 99 counties, and their campaign operation really focused on the grassroots organization, telling folks, you got to show up and caucus on the night of the Iowa caucus. And the Trump campaign did not have that type of an operation. Ted Cruz won. Who's replicated that this go around? Well, Ron DeSantis and his campaign operation and the super PAC tied to them have tried to do what Ted Cruz did eight years ago. Now, polling does not reflect that they are going to have the same outcome that Ted Cruz did eight years ago. But that's what we're going to be watching for, because they have invested so much time and energy. Ron DeSantis has, over the last seven months, had more than 150 events here in the state of Iowa. Compare that to about 15 for Donald Trump. So the question is, does that investment of time on the ground for Ron DeSantis, and he's had three times the number of events of Nikki Haley, does that ultimately bear some rewards for him? And could he have a strong second place and come and close to Donald Trump and really go into New Hampshire making a, a strong play? And you've said something very important here, Vaughn, and I want to tease it out just a bit. And I know we're tight on time, but I think it's key here. You talked about a strong second place. It is not even, I mean, you tell me, it doesn't seem to me like it is even in the vocabulary right now for those in and around the DeSantis campaign to be thinking about an outright win. The question is what the margin would be. And I say that simply based on where the polling is and where the polling has been consistently now for months. Talk me through that, right? Because when you say strong second place, if he only, you know, right. loses, quote unquote, by like, four points versus 40. I mean, there's a huge spectrum of, of what that could look like, right? I mean, I just want to be sort of clear about that. Right. The only place that we're talking about anybody else coming in is a strong second place. And in New Hampshire, which is eight days after Iowa, Nikki Haley is talking about currently being in a strong second place position there. But the problem is when you look at all the states beyond that in South Carolina and beyond, right. Donald Trump is dominating in these states. We talk about California in March. They're talking about Donald Trump getting more than 50 percent. I mean, these are the sort of circumstances that Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis are running up against. And frankly, they don't have the same amount of money that Donald Trump does either. This is a big uphill battle here in the month of January for these other candidates. Vaughn Hilliard watching all of it live for us from Des Moines. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. We've got a lot more to get to here on the show, including the NFL. Just coming down on the owner of the Carolina Panthers for throwing a drink as his team was losing to Jacksonville. We'll tell you what it cost him coming up. Plus, a mystery may be solved tonight in New York. What officials there think caused a series of explosions. We'll tell you in just a second. DHS officials today tell NBC News migrant crossings hit an all-time high in December, with approximately 300,000 people crossing the southern border last month. That shattered some of the records previously. That is being felt well beyond just the border, with tens of thousands of migrants taking buses and planes to cities like New York and Chicago. New York's mayor issuing an executive order to put some restrictions on when and where buses carrying migrants can legally arrive in the city, but bus operators seem to have found a loophole in the system dropping off migrants across the Hudson River at a train station in New Jersey. From there, they hop a local train to New York. Antonia Hilton is joining us now. You know, the mayor of New York, Eric Adams, has tried to discourage some of these folks from coming to New York City. He's put signs at the border. These new restrictions are in place. But at the same time, you've got, for example, Texas putting people on buses and sending them to New York in big numbers. Talk us through what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Well, Hallie, what we're seeing is that people are still arriving even with the new restrictions in place. And as you mentioned, there are some workarounds that these bus companies seem to have figured out. But here are what the new rules look like. These buses are supposed to give 32 hours of advance notice. They're supposed to arrive only between 8.30 a.m. and noon. And they're supposed to go only to the port authority. Anywhere else, the NYPD can seize your buses. You'll be charged with a misdemeanor and fines. And so that's why you're seeing people drop in New Jersey. So the question now is, will some of the officials over there put similar orders in place? The reality is, this is local officials scrambling to solve a national political problem or really a global problem. Take a listen to a conversation that I had with an Ecuadorian family. And when you hear what they've been experiencing, you'll understand why some of this or none of this really is going to end anytime soon. Nosotros tuvimos que salir prácticamente huyendo por la por el temor de nuestra seguridad y la seguridad de mis Nos fuimos obligados a a emigrar a este país para poder buscar un mejor futuro para nuestra familia, para nuestros hijos. The family is 
experiencing, they say, death threats that is a part of all of the gang and cartel violence that has become so common in countries like Ecuador, Honduras, and Guatemala. And this has been going on for years. Those groups have taken over rural parts of those countries. They, uh, it's impossible to get the government to intervene. And so those families know that legally coming here is incredibly difficult, but they feel with their lives at risk there is no option. So really what to look for right now at a time when Congress isn't doing much is what is Blinken able to do? What is our president able to do in relationship with those other countries to solve or curb some of this, Sally? So much of it, too. I mean, listen, there's obviously, and you allude to this, there's obviously a political nexus here. Do you think people are paying attention to that? And I say that because it's political on the state level. You look at Texas, you look at New York, right? Republican leader in Texas, Democratic leader in New York City. The, the federal side where I am in Washington, we are seeing even today more discussions happening in the Capitol, not far from where I'm sitting, about this issue of border funding. How much is, is it your sense that people or voters are paying attention to this as a political issue and not just, as it, as it also is, um, you know, a quality of life, a human issue? You know, what's interesting, Hallie, is when I speak to voters here in New York City, for them it is a local political issue, but not quite yet a presidential political mm. issue that may change in the coming months because some of those voters haven't quite clued in because they're not, for the most part, paying much attention to the Republican side of the cycle. I do think for more conservative voters, this is one of the top issues. I mean, they're yeah. watching and talking about the border all the time. I think that's why you see Democrats like Eric Adams coming out so strong and talking about this all the time. They're really trying to put their line in the sand. But in a community as diverse as New York, where there are people who are themselves the children of immigrants who built up this city, they have a very nuanced take where they really want more money from the government, more support, and an orderly process, more so than you know what you hear in other parts of the country where people might say, shut all of this down, erect a border wall. The conversation here feels a bit different. Antonio Hilton, live for us there uh, from New York. Antonia, thank you very much for being with us. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, we're learning more about that suspected shark attack in Hawaii that killed a surfer, Jason Carter, who officials say was 39 years old. An eyewitness tells NBC News the shark pulled Carter down into the water, saying the shark was as big as a pickup truck. Officials say it was the first deadly shark encounter in Hawaii, the first and only in 2023. Number two, Ohio Republican Congressman Bill Johnson is resigning from the House a little earlier than expected. He's apparently going to officially be out on January 21st, according to his team, to start a new job as president of Youngstown State University. He reportedly wasn't going to start there until March initially, but this does mean that for a bit, Republicans' slim majority in the House will get even smaller sooner. Number three, firefighters this morning responding to reports of small explosions on Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island in New York City, but they didn't know why. Well, we seem to have an answer tonight. The USGS says there was a 1.7 magnitude earthquake right by a part of Queens right around the same time. That's after a 2.3 magnitude earthquake near Washington, D.C. Number four, the NFL says the owner of the Carolina Panthers has been fined $300,000 after tossing his drink into the stands after a game this weekend. You see this? You see it there? Ali you can't do that. You know, Ali I mean, whatever. A league spokesperson says his conduct was unacceptable. The Panthers have the worst record in the NFL this year. Number five, tennis star Novak Djokovic may be known as the Joker, but when a reporter at a news conference in Australia asked him to wish fans Happy New Year in Chinese, he showed his language skills are anything but a joke. Listen to this. And if you're like, that sounded like more than Happy New Year, you're right. He asked how everybody was doing. He thanked them for supporting him. You can see the reaction. People were just dazzled by his proficiency. When we come back, a missing 17-year-old is safe tonight after a so-called cyber kidnapping. What it is and who police say is most at risk next. Plus, the Iranians releasing a Spanish soccer fan more than a year after he was detained on charges of espionage. The new details coming up. A lot of questions tonight over who's responsible for a bizarre kidnapping scheme that led to the disappearance of a 17-year-old Chinese exchange student. He's been found safely. Take a look at this video. There he is in a tent, apparently, cold and alone in the Utah mountains after his family back in China reported he'd been kidnapped. Thing was, it was apparently all part of a so-called virtual hoax, a cyber kidnapping hoax. The family wired $80,000 to the teen's alleged captures. 
after they got pictures where it looked like he was being held. Those virtual kidnappers had apparently told the student they'd hurt his family unless he actually went out into the wilderness and took pictures to make it look like he was kidnapped. Utah police said they were tipped off by both the FBI and Chinese officials that this could all be part of what they call a disturbing criminal trend, a virtual or cyber kidnapping, with Chinese foreign exchange students being increasingly targeted. NBC's Liz Kreutz is following this for us. Go micro and macro for us, Liz, right? Micro, what in the world happened in this situation with this particular teenager? And macro, is this really a trend? Has it happened more than once? What do we know about it? And why are these Chinese exchange students apparently being targeted? Yeah, Holly, I mean, definitely this is a very extreme and unusual case. And officials say that this poor young man, Kai, had been manipulated and controlled by some of these cyber kidnappers for potentially weeks. They first made contact him with him on December 20th when police say he was trying to go camp, had camping gear. They found it suspicious, so they helped bring him back to his host family outside Salt Lake City. But then a week later, on December 28th, that is when uh, his family reported him missing and then police began their search and found him in this remote part of the mountains. They say that part of the reason that he was there was that the farther and the more remote he can be and the longer he's away from police and his family, the more they could extort from his family. Macro, though, this certainly is an unusual trend, but it's not unusual to see these cyber scams, especially with the use of AI and being able to recreate voices, these phone spoofing scams as well. And so these are targeting vulnerable people like elderly people and often foreign exchange students, officials say, who are scared away from their family, maybe don't speak the language. And so they're more apt to be targeted, Hallie. Liz Kreutz, thank you very much. Live for us there from out west. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of South Korea, some graphic and shocking video of the moment that a man stabbed a politician in the neck while he was touring a city. Police say the suspect approached the Democratic Party leader and said she wanted an autograph before attacking. He was rushed to the hospital, went through surgery, and is reportedly now recovering in the ICU. The suspect was arrested. Out of Hong Kong, business magnate and pro-democracy advocate Jimmy Lai pleaded not guilty today to charges of endangering China's national security. Prosecutors say he conspired to collude with foreign powers, breaking the country's big national security law. The U.S. and Britain have called the trial politically motivated. They say he should be released. And out of Spain, a soccer fan detained in Iran for more than a year is now back home tonight. The man planned to walk all the way from Spain to Qatar for the 2022 World Cup. He disappeared in October that year at the Iran-Iraq border and was arrested on espionage charges. So listen, as the holiday season wears off and we go back to the reality of our daily lives, that reality for a lot of us is debt because of all the gifts we bought that we got to pay for somehow. The average family spent nearly a thousand bucks on holiday gifts this year, according to a Gallup poll. But you may not have thought of paying for some of those gifts with your gifts, like the gift cards you may have gotten. $30 billion worth of gift cards were expected to be handed out this holiday season. But you know what? A lot of people don't use them. You just stick them in a drawer. Forget about them. That's free money gone bye-bye. Well, we've got some tips here from our senior business correspondent, Christine Romans, on how to use them to help you pay down debt. This is interesting because if I have a gift card to Amazon, I don't yep. know that I'm necessarily thinking about using that to pay down my credit card. Right. How does it work? Well, look, there are a couple of different places, several places really, where you can go and you can trade in those cards for cash. You're going to get 70 or 80 cents on the dollar, and that might seem like that's not a very good deal. But half of all of these cards are never redeemed. Half, Hallie. So that means people have basically gold sitting in their drawers yeah. that, they're <laughs> that they're not going to use. So if you can get some money out of it, turn around and then pay down that high interest credit card debt credit cards are 20 percent. that's the apr right now you should do that holiday season's gonna be tough i think for folks yeah. right like you feel this pressure to buy stuff make sure you've got presents under the tree or whatever but we know that people are going into debt yeah. right we know that that's been an issue now especially right now at this moment what do people need to keep in mind for debt and i think that you're the perfect person to ask about this because <laughs> i know you're very into like that pragmatic focus here <laughs> well right now this is not like other years when you could sort of have benign neglect and maybe you run a balance and you're like oop and you try to pay it off you know by the summer you've got 20 percent interest rates yeah. on credit cards and already a pile of debt that is topped 1.03 trillion that's you know credit card debt and so at 20 percent that's really dangerous a debt spiral can happen really Real fast. So people need to make a plan. You got to figure out. You got to figure out where you're going to come up with money to pay those things down. You know, when you're carrying a balance here, you're only paying minimum payments. You are going to be in debt for years, 
years, Hallie. Minimum payments are really uh, a dangerous thing for most families. Pay as much as you can, get out from under that debt at 20% interest, it's a real problem. Also, call your credit card company. There was a really good lending tree survey that found that 76% of people who called their card company and asked for a lower interest rate, they got it by the average of six points. That's real money. And that's, you know, time invested, but time worth it, right? I mean, totally. if you can make that phone call and get that back. Totally. Uh, Chris, Christine Romans, great Welcome to back. See you. Thank you. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> Thank you, friend, and thank you for all you did while I was gone and overseas. Anytime. Appreciate you. Thank you. We got a lot more coming up here on the show, including some new warnings over, you know, those IV drips, those injections that people use for like energy or to help a hangover. We'll tell you what experts are saying about staying safe at some of those IV spas coming up. Tonight, new warnings about stuff like IV drips and injections at med spas that are unregulated. You've probably heard of these places. People sometimes go to them for like quick boost to energy or, you know, they're hungover. They go, they think they feel better after. Maybe they just want straight up vitamins or even to try to dissolve fat. But here's the problem. Doctors say these IVs can make you pretty sick. The FDA recently warned about reports that some patients develop what they call severe infections and skin deformities after getting unauthorized shots. It's all part of this growing wellness industry worth somewhere around $15 billion right now with questions, of course, about oversight on that front. Erica Edwards is joining us now. Okay, gut check, right? These med spas became popular. People would go get an IV. They say they feel better afterwards. What do they need to be looking for? What is the real risk level here? Hey, Hallie. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, many of these med spas do operate safely. And those that do should be absolutely willing to answer some questions that you have to ensure your safety. Number one, who owns and operates the med spa? Uh, number two, who is administering my treatment and what credentials does that person have? Do not be afraid to ask to see a license or a diploma. And also, is there a licensed medical practi practitioner on site just in case there are complications? It's also fair to ask where they got those products. The FDA, as you mentioned, warned recently that unlicensed workers at some of these spas were using unapproved, unauthorized treatments that they got off the internet. And as a result, bacterial infections are on the rise, Hallie. So how are the med spas responding to this? And what are you supposed to do if you wanna to go to one of these places, but you'd rather not come home with a bacterial infection? Well, usually those infections occur at the site of the injection or the shot in or of the um, IV. And generally, it's because uh, equipment may not have been sterilized appropriately or they were using unapproved. Approved, um, uh, you know, mixtures. We talked with one woman in California who developed a severe bacterial infection after she got hundreds of shots all over her body. They, she said that the workers there told her that the more um, uh, injections that she got, the better. Uh, within 24 hours, her skin was just excruciating and she felt like it was on fire. Now, there are no federal standards for med spas and IV hydration clinics. It's the states that oversee those facilities, uh, all with different rules. Now, we talked with the CEO of the American Med Spa Association. He said that what's missing from the industry, Hallie, is a baseline level of, of consistency across all states. And even the industry is calling for a little bit more oversight, Hallie. Super interesting. Erica Edwards, thank you very much for that reporting. That's it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.